At the beginning of 2013, I got a request. Would you consider, Sarah, teaching creative writing in a men's medium security federal prison? So I thought hard about this for about two seconds, which is about how long I take to make all my life decisions. And I said, sure, why not? I taught middle school. It's <laughs> not going to be that hard, right? So I agreed. I created my lesson plans, and I walked into the prison. Um, and walking into a prison is a really intimidating thing to do. Uh, on the first day that I got there, you, you cross the barbed wire like that, and then you come to a metal detector, and you wait for someone to decide that they will let you through. And no one decides anything quickly in a prison. So you wait a long time, and then you eventually get to go through this intimidating metal detector. And that's when I learned my first lesson in prison, you don't wear an underwire bra because someone's gonna find out whether or not that's a weapon, and that's fun. <laughs> so, so after it was determined that I wasn't carrying uh, weapons under my breasts into the prison, they let me through, and you walk across the long um, c corridor of buildings on, on a prison compound, and, and um, there's men everywhere, they're moving to the rec field and they're moving to the education block and they're moving to dinner. And I was female and there wasn't a lot of that in the prison. So every head turns and watches me walk across the prison yard. And then I get to the education block. And there's a library and then there's classrooms. So you walk through the library and you get to your classroom that is encased in glass. Um, and so everyone in the library gets to watch your class as well. And there isn't a guard in a classroom in prison. There's a guard in the education block, but he's, he wasn't in the classroom. So it was me and these 12 guys. And I was scared to death. And I'm shaking. And I'm holding this piece of paper trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And there's a guy in the middle of the room. And he just... He's kind of slumped down and he's cool. And he says, why are you so nervous? Don't you know you're in the safest medium security federal prison in the United States? Relax, you're in the Care Bear prisons. <laughs> and everyone starts laughing and they all start going, oh yeah, you're in the Care, this is nothing. This is, nothing will happen to you here, relax. So I relaxed and around that time is when I threw away all my lesson plans. I knew that anything I had been prepared for wasn't gonna happen. Um, and I learned that I was just in a room full of humans who were more like me than they were not. Uh, I came to write this poem, Sweet Potato Pie, that I dedicated to all of the students that I had at FCI Beckley. And before I read it, I want to explain that every line in this poem is true. It's uh, really dedicated to one student. This is his life story. He was born to a mother uh, who was a crack addict. And when he was about eight years old, he had a newborn baby sister. So he, lives, he lived in South Chicago, and he's eight. And the guys in the street determined that he, this boy needs to learn how to take care of his baby sister because the mother can't do it. And they take him out into the streets and they teach him at eight how to deal drugs and they teach him how to lie about his age. And so he spends most of his life in prison, but he was taught it at eight and he was taught it in a way that was compassionate because it was the only way he was gonna survive. And he was taught that as a way to help his sister survive. So, sweet potato pie. Let me go back one here. And Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Cutie pie at seven, stealing anything not nailed down by eight, high and ganged up by nine. Daddy left for a barbed wire bathroom, wanted to meet St. Peter on a full stomach and did Cauterizing as it goes, a bullet in the belly rests like the fullness of time. Nodding and mumbling, mother can't help with homework except by sleeping instead of cracking your skull. 
Baby sisters aren't born knowing how to leave. Vomit on school clothes, maggots in the pancakes. The streets of South Chicago have wide arms, crooked at the bend, open for all its children. Night becomes father, day becomes mother. The streets will believe you when you say you're 13, even if your teeth say otherwise. A quarter pound of weed pays the rent and pink Velcro shoes because double dutch is hard. Tried as an adult is funny, like a chicken fried in canola oil crossing the road. Down 17 years, Marvin Gaye still wondering, and all you remember is your grandmother's voice like sweet potato pie. So I had these fantasies of what I was going to go into the prison and do. I thought I was going to play some sort of creative writing as therapy practice. I, th I thought, you know, I'm going to help these guys really look at their lives for the first time, and we're going to put it on paper. And what I didn't realize, what I, was, what I wasn't smart enough to know yet, was that by the time a guy has sat in prison for a couple years and gets to the point where he says, yeah, I'm going to take a creative writing class, it's, I'm, it's pretty obvious he's already started looking at his life. So I, I, I learned that the rocks had all been turned over in their life. I wasn't going to teach them to look at anything. They were already looking straight in the face of their shame. They were already looking at their regret. Almost every single one of them was fathers, was a father. And they were all lamenting the fact that they weren't raising their children. They weren't, they weren't bragging about what had gotten them there. And by the way, they were, I think all drug offenders, there wasn't a violent person in the room. They were there because they had dealt drugs uh, in many scenarios like the one that I told you about. But to prove the ways in which these guys were looking at themselves, I want to read a story that one of my students wrote. And it was the last day of class of this session. Everyone had been reading for a couple days their stories. I had asked them to write about food because I somewhere along the way discovered that writing about food was a way to get them to write about home. So this guy, he says, no, I'm not going to, I can't do it. I, I've struggled with this and I just can't do it. And the rest of the class said, oh, yes, you will. And, and they said, you'll stand up and you'll do it. And they held him to the fire. I, I was going to say, if he doesn't want to do it, guys, don't let him do it. And they were like, no, we did it and he's going to do it. So this man who was in his 40s, who usually wrote about his daughter who was 20, he, he wrote almost all his poetry had something to do with his regret surrounding her life. And he finally stands up and he's shaking about as bad as I was shaking that first day of class. And he starts with an epigraph from a poem by Robert Lowell, Fall 1961. A father's no shield for his child. We are all a lot of wild spiders crying together, but without tears. First day home. I was apprehensive when I stepped through the gate leading to the backyard. It was the first day of June, and the southern sun was displaying its might. I didn't know what was causing me to sweat more, my nerves or the heat. My father was sitting on the deck in a lawn chair, close to his overpruned dogwood tree. The grill was in front of him. Citronella candles burned along the perimeter of the deck. He was wearing his favorite Lakers t-shirt, faded camouflage pants, and brown house shoes. He had a drink in one hand and a pair of tongs in the other. His face lit up when our eyes met. Hey, Mon, he said, West Indian drawl ever present. Good to have you home. It's good to be home, Pop, I said, planting a kiss on his cheek. You hungry? What you cooking? Oh, shit, your favorite food. Sounds good to me. He stepped over to the grill, flipped up the lid, and tended to his food with the same meticulous manner he tended to all his affairs. I looked over his shoulder. Jerk chicken and steak smells great, Pop. You must have read my mind. You said they didn't feed you much protein, he said, looking me up and down. I can tell you got skinny. 
My first day home from prison was no major event. My stepbrother, who had picked me up in his 2009 Corvette, had to rush to work after dropping me off. My two other siblings no longer lived in the area, and my stepmother was at work. I stood back and watched in awe at the great man before me. Although we lived apart for much of my youth, he was always more of a parent than my mother. She had four boys and raised none of us. It's strange because all her son's fathers were better parents than she was, but none of us became great fathers. Pop was always a great father, but he wasn't always a great cook. When he was younger and single, he burned every meal he prepared, even toast. As he got better, I begged him to share his secrets, and he just said, watch. That was the way he chose to teach life lessons, through his actions. I was seeing, but I wasn't watching. When I had to call my father and tell him I'd been arrested again for selling weed, it was the hardest thing I'd ever had to do in my life. I knew his heart would be broken. But he said, you may not always do the right thing, but you're my son and I love you. Coming from a man who was generous with everything but his words, that meant the world to me. Sometimes in life, you can have the best teachers and still never learn the lessons. He's out now. He's in North Carolina, and uh, he's doing well with a um, car detailing business. And that, this is the next lesson I learned. That's Page High School in Greensboro, North Carolina. I went to Page High School. And as you're sitting in class with these guys and you get to know their stories through their stories and through the discussions we would have, um, I discovered that I was the same age as and from the same town as one of those guys. And then we discovered we went to high school together. And had he stayed in high school, he would have graduated the same year as I did. But really, that's where our similarities end. He was living with his mother and his five siblings, his aunt and uncle and their children, in a, in a um, house that was in the projects called Smith Homes in Greensboro. I was living in my parents' brick house that we moved out to the suburbs in. So he dropped out of college. It was pretty much understood that that's what he, I mean, he dropped out of high school. He did not drop out of college because he never went there. Um, he dropped out of high school because it was pretty much understood that's what he would do. And I went on to college because it was understood that that's what I would do. Um, so that was a, a real awakening for me, realizing that our, I, coming from the same place doesn't mean that you're gonna go to the same place. And so, this goes back to the fantasy of what I thought I was doing in prison, that I was, I was going to you know, save the world, that I was in there to bring the light of poetry to these guys, and it was gonna change something, I think. And in, in that fantasy, I was something between Michelle Pfeiffer in, a da in Dangerous Minds and Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society. You know, I, I probably stayed up late at night imagining jumping up on a table and reading poetry to these guys and that they would fall backwards and be so moved. But um, that didn't happen. And well, I also really had a great desire to be a black man. So I brought in Siku Sundiata's poetry from Harlem, and I thought maybe if I reached deep enough into Harlem and brought out the, the, the poetry and the music from Harlem that I could say, I'm you, I'm with you, we are the same, I feel you. And I thought if I brought in Dwayne Betts' poetry, he was tried as an adult at 16, went to prison for eight years, and is now uh, a very famous poet in the country. I spelled his name wrong on there. And if, if he did watch this, I'm sorry. There's too many E's in your name. Um, so there was something in me that wanted to be like, I get this, I'm you. But the truth is, I didn't get anything. And I, I didn't know what I was talking about. And along the way, I learned that what I was really there to do is go forth and save myself. Um, it wasn't about them. They were fine. They were saving themselves. And I had to face the fact that I was dealing with some deep 
shame about who I was and my responsibility and who they were. So there was this long history of this white guilt thing that I was trying to undo in this prison full of black men that I don't think should have been there. So that was the lesson I learned along the way. And here's a few other things that I learned. Six million people are under correctional supervision in the U.S. Two million, more than two million, are in prisons. That number has tripled since our war on drugs in the 1980s. The United States boasts a prison population greater than any on Earth. That's more than Russia, more than China, more than everyone. We're at the top of the list. We're number one in this. And no other society in human history has imprisoned so many of its own citizens. Those are the facts of what our prison system is. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's something wrong with that. But what I'd like to leave with are some of the words from my students written in their own hand. I think it's also important to see it written in their hand. This first one, the top one, is from that guy who went to high school with me. He says, and remember, he's from Greensboro, North Carolina. Greensboro is where the sit-ins were, the lunch counter sit-ins. That, that's where we're from. Over a cup of darkness, God sat down at lunch counters to write long letters to me, urging me to believe, to dream like a king. I just like that line. And this, and this last one is from a student who was also out. He's in New Hampshire, and I got to visit him two weeks ago in a halfway house where uh, he's awaiting his admittance to college. And um, he says, you can use my name. Go ahead. His name is Saxton Lynch, and he's an amazing person, and he will do great things. And this is his poem, a, a bit from one of his poems. My prayers loosen the Bible belt a notch. I'll send a postcard from the flip side. And that's all I have. But before I finish, one last thought. I believe these lines, these millions of lines that are being written in prisons are going to be read eventually in the same way that our children are reading the diary of Anne Frank. Thank you.